the big screen review on Movie Magic. Hello there, how's it going? Brand new weekend, so with a brand new lineup of movies. Well, the key one we're looking at at the moment is the new Judd Apatow produced film called Bridesmaids, which may seem like a bit of a girly chick flick, but it's actually really enjoyable for all the fellas too, because it's genuinely funny. All the girls hate me right now. So you're like the maid of dishonor. It's rated 15, stars Kristen Wiig, also Rose Byrne, Maya Rudolph, and the fantastically cool John Hamm, who you'll know from Mad Men. And I had the great pleasure of chatting with him earlier in the week, a guy with so much charisma. So you'll hear from him in just a few moments. First of all, though, some background about the movie. So it focuses on Annie, played by Kristen Wiig, whose life just goes nowhere. She can't really get a break. But when she discovers her lifetime best friend is engaged, she really has to serve as Lillian's maid of honor. This is her mindset. She just has to do this job. So even though she's broke and completely out of love, Annie dives into all of the required rituals as she gets to know the other ladies in the sort of bridal party. So there's one particular rival, Helen, who's played by Rose Byrne, who is perfectly poised to fulfill all the duties that Annie struggles through. And she kind of likes to see Annie fail, you know. What is that? I got engaged. What? He asked me last night. What? I know! That's why he's been acting so weird, because he's a terrible liar and he thought he was ever going to blow it. He was ignoring me and I thought he was going to break up with me and... Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! I know! As I mentioned, I was chatting with John Hamm. First of all, I asked him about his character, Ted. He's a terrible person. And, uh, hopefully comedically terrible. But, uh, he's the worst person on the planet. And, uh, exists solely as a cautionary tale. And then we spoke about the film's themes. It's really not a wedding movie. It's a story about friends. And kind of what happens when you're out of sync with your friends. And Maya and Kristen are so lovely together, and the relationship is so real between those characters that it's hilarious and heartbreaking because you, you watch this poor girl who can't get out of her own way kind of going through this experience and thinking, like, oh, she needs to, like, she's losing her friend. And that's at the heart of it what makes it so kind of emotionally worthwhile. <laughs> Tim Burton's DVD Roundup on Movie Magic. We're going to be chatting with Jason Isaacs, the award-winning actor who probably is best known as Lucius Malfoy in Harry Potter, although he'd rather be known as something a bit more diverse than that. Now, well, recently he starred in the BBC TV production Case Histories. It just finished last weekend, and it's out on DVD and Blu-ray from next week. So we chatted about that show, as well as his brand-new film for John Singleton, a few other things as well. He's actually over here in Northern Ireland quite a lot. So it was interesting to hear about his familial stories with Jimmy Nesbitt and also Jimmy Nesbitt's mum. And you'll also hear how pleased he is that his wife can now finally watch something that he's in. Tim Burton's DVD Roundup. Jason Isaacs, good to really chat with you and meet you here. We're talking about case histories. Uh, this has gone down a storm with, with viewers and with critics alike, which I suppose is always a, a nice feeling. Well, the most important thing is it's gone down a storm my wife. She hasn't watched almost <laughs> anything I've done in 25 years. She's no interest at all, but she's now decided she's fallen completely in love with Jackson Brody, which is nice, except that I'm being compared unfavorably to him constantly in my household now. Oh, okay. I look like him, but I don't behave like him. Yeah, but this character now, it, it's pretty complex now, because I, I know you're a fan of the Kate Atkinson novels, mm. and so I presume you, you'd read them all before you even started. Well, I, I, weirdly, I had done the audiobooks a long time before, so I have oh, right. not only played Jackson Brody and read these books out loud, but I've played all the parts, uh, all the women too, and uh, what was odd for me when I took the job was watching people come in and, and play the parts that... I felt I should be doing. I, I thought at first they'd offered it me and I'd be doing prosthetics and it would be me, like Alec Guinness, playing all the parts. <laughs> it's, it's gone back a bit, yeah. They were all better than me, I hasten to add. It took about it, for a, a second at the beginning of everybody's performance when they come in, when I go, mm, I wonder how they're going to do it, and they start, and I thought, every time I thought, yep, yeah, that's better than me. 
Um, the the stories are fascinating, though, aren't they? And and, and uh, uh, what what you play essentially is a you're a former soldier and a policeman, aren't you? And you've got this very well, it's like a tough guy exterior, but at the end of the day, you, you're pretty soft inside. Oh my you? God, he's well. That's why I liked playing him. That's why I was hungry to play him, really, because he was so he's a big walking mass of contradictions. He really doesn't know himself. He thinks that he's this hard bitten, cynical Yorkshireman. In fact, he's incredibly sentimental he listens to music that you know that makes you weep and he uh he can't say no to anybody so anyone who's vulnerable or lost or needing help in any way he you know neglects all the cases in his business completely to uh to try and bring them some kind of closure because he has this terrible tragedy in his past that he can't ever resolve he he's on a mission to resolve everybody else's troubles um, but I, I'd read the books, and what I loved about uh, the books when I narrated them, and what I was terrified about, really, uh, bringing them to the screen, was we would get the tone wrong, because she is a um, she's a major literary figure, Kate, but she's a brilliant storyteller, uh, and she somehow walks a fine line between tragedy and comedy, and absurdism and realism, and, and that's a very, very difficult thing. It's a very kind of fragile mixture in the books, and, and there are so many things that can go wrong bringing that to the screen that I'm, I, I feel such a huge sense of relief that we seem to have pulled it off and that the public are liking it, the critics are liking it, and that Kate likes it. Well, I think another attribute, apart from the cast and the stories, is the production credits. Like, you've got John Keane, terrific music. I love the opening mm. credits with the, the very clever and classy animation, you know, across the yeah. opera. And, and Edinburgh itself, which yes. is a star of the show. I mean, Edinburgh, in, any way, in many ways, is a major character in the show. It's the most beautifully cinematic city, and, and there are shots that just take your breath away all the time. I know. No, it is beautiful. And you spent a lot of time there as a student, didn't you? I did. I mean, I didn't study there, but I went up there as a student to the Fringe Festival every year. I took plays there every single year as a student. And then when I was at drama school, I took plays up as well. And uh, and then I had films in the film festival when I was a bit older. And then last year, the year, oddly, the year that I ended up going back to shoot Case Histories, I was a judge uh, you know, on the jury at the film festival. And it's a stunningly, stunningly beautiful city. But what's interesting about it is, you know, you're in the middle of this place and at one end of the right in the center of this urban metropolis there's a castle and the other end there's a, a giant hill small mountain arthur's seat and in the middle right at the heart of the city is a beautiful park like a big bowl it's kind of a low dip and that where they have concerts and there's flowers and it's an incredibly serene oasis and if you do the walking tour of old edinburgh you find out that that was in fact a lake of untreated stagnant sewage for hundreds of years and that people must have had a very different experience of edinburgh not that long ago oh very much so <laughs> well, those ghost tours are great as well they do up there well, they've got a thing called Mary King's Close, which is you can go underneath the Royal Mile and there are stories of tenements where people lived up until very recently because they've just built over it, but you could still inhabit it. Mm. And way down there, there were, uh, there were people living and working uh, up until, I think, the early 20th century. Yeah, no, it's incredible. Other than the, the case history show, uh, now, I, I know that you'll be very well known as Lucius Malfoy in Harry Potter, which is soon to hit cinemas. And you're also going to be seen very shortly in John Singleton's new film, which is called Abduction. Mm. I saw a bit of it the other day, actually. It's fabulous. It's a real roller coaster ride. It's a, it's a good old fashioned chase movie, basically. Uh, um, Taylor Lautner, he of Team Jacob fame, um, keeps his shirt on, but uh, starts running and That's doesn't really stop to the end of the film. And what was amazing meeting Taylor is he's this prodigy, he's this kind of physical prodigy. I didn't know. If you YouTube him, you can see that when he was a kid, he was giving displays at the World Karate Tournament, various karate exhibitions of uh, kicking. He's kind of, of kicking and jumping and spinning and twisting and all that stuff. And he can still do all that stuff. He hasn't done it for a long time, but he's such a, a gifted young man that what was hard for him was, <laughs> you know, there's no point having somebody who can fight like that at the beginning of a film because he just looks like he can take all the baddies. So, for instance, I have a very long boxing sequence with him in which I'm meant to look better than him. Well, in the blink of my eye, he could hit me 50 times if he wanted to. <laughs> so he, he, it was very, very, it was a challenge for him to look like he had anything to learn. Yeah. And you mentioned you're, you're going over to the States again soon to do more TV. You, you've done The West Wing and The State Within, and also Brotherhood has been a huge success for you. Yeah, Brotherhood was a, was a big critical success, but it was on cable, uh, which meant that it didn't, ha it didn't have to, and it didn't have a very big audience, but it, it won you know, awards, and, and people watched it uh, a lot on the East Coast, a lot on the West Coast, and almost not at all in between. Um, I'm about to go off and do a, a network television show called Awake for NBC, and uh, that's a far more... 
cutthroat atmosphere. If people don't watch it in giant numbers, uh, you just get cancelled immediately. And I know I've got numbers of friends who have been sitting in the trailer in the middle of shooting their show, and I've said three, four, five, six, whatever, and they get a phone call and they go, don't go back to work this afternoon. They go, what are you talking about? And the agent goes, look outside the door, honey. And they open the door and they go, where's everyone going? And um, <laughs> they get cancelled a lot. So I think it's a great script. We made the first episode. It's fabulous. And we're going to go back and shoot the rest of the series. And I hope that the public like it. But if they don't, I'll be back. And there'll be a lot more case histories, which I look forward to enormously as well. Yeah. Uh, we, obviously, the people who make it, would like you to watch it on television because that then the, the people at the BBC uh, in the smart suits will go, uh, we should make more of them. <laughs> and if you buy it on DVD a week later, uh, that might be the last of it. But either way, I hope people enjoy it as much as we enjoyed making it. Absolutely. It's also on BBC iPlayer, which will probably please them as well. Mm -hmm. Well, oddly enough, apparently they don't have any way of measuring how many people watch things on iPlayer. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. I'm a bit of a computer geek. I know that there is technology that knows the number of eyes on every web page, but for some reason it doesn't factor into the numbers. But, I, I, you know, it's not mostly about numbers. I, I, I love being a storyteller, and uh, I very often do obscure things that nobody sees because I enjoy making them. I love making case histories, and uh, it's, it's nice for a change to be something that is kind of surfing the wave of the zeitgeist because everywhere I go, people are coming up in the street and saying how much they're enjoying it. Jason Isaacs, really good talking to you, and I'm sure we'll see more case histories in the future. I hope so. That's it for now. Coming next week, Transformers 3. It would need to be better than the second one, wouldn't it? Let's hope so. We'll have all the news about it, plus interviews with the composer Steve Jablonski and Linkin Park in next week's show. I'm Tim Burden. I'll see you at the movies. Movie Magic with Tim Burden, the movie maestro. I remember when Jimmy wasn't working, we came to see... Uh, my wife was doing a touring version of Accidental Death of an Anarchist at the National Theatre, and we went to Coleraine, and uh, Jimmy's parents came, and... Jimmy's mum came backstage to meet uh, my wife. We were staying with his parents, and Alan Cumming, who was the lead, and she said, very good, Alan, it's great. Listen, do you think my son James will ever make a living in this business? <laughs> and I went, oh, I don't know. And he said, because, you know, someone like you, Alan, you're very successful, but James is really struggling. <laughs> he was, mummy, please. you got to um, love mothers, honestly, haven't you? Yeah. Of course, he's doing so well with Monroe. He's the most successful it? television actor in uh, Britain, possibly the history of the world. I think, uh, yeah, I think Monroe has uh, transported well over, overseas. Yeah. And he's now, of course, going to be global because he's uh, over there doing The Hobbit. Yeah, absolutely. Jimmy's gone global. That's right, that's right. That could be the title of his autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt you'll contribute to that. I hope. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm an old yeah, lag. I've been around a while. Um, as they say in America, it's not my first barbecue. I hate it when they say it there. I don't know why I just said it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's funny that, isn't it? It's funny whenever you say something you ha you actually realise you shouldn't have said. Here's one that I hate in America. Mm. They c People are going, you know, I think it's terrific, and I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. And I think, <laughs> why would I want you to? <laughs> Sorry, where does that come from, that notion that, that would be a good thing? That sounds like a torture. Uh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense, does it? No, no. <laughs> It's just like they spell things wrong as well. Yes. I'm right. moving there in a few weeks. I should I should not bite the hand that feeds. <laughs> I'm off to do an American television series. Another one? Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Excellent. Well, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Fingers crossed anyway.